speak, from quarter to quarter. And vector computing is at $137,000 a processor. So the last column, what we came up with was, from a user perspective, what can you get for a million dollars? So what kind of computer room can you fill up for a million dollars based on different technologies? And very clearly, this is showing the price advantage of clusters. You can have a 514 processor cluster versus 150 for the next level. And the footnote was, from a user perspective, what can you get for a million dollars? So what kind of computer room can you fill up for a million dollars based on different technologies? And very clearly, this is showing the price advantage of clusters. You can have a 514 processor cluster versus 150 for the next level. And the footnotes we have there is, if 32-bit processing or 32-bit processing with 64-bit memory extensions or extensions is good enough, it will most likely win in most cases. And that's what we're seeing in the marketplace. If true 64-bit processing is required, then IA64 has between a 2 to 1 to a 3 to 1 advantage versus risk or vector or risk processing. In the world of vector processing, uh, really is for only when you can't run it anywhere else and you require a vector processor, given the price differential. And that's what we've seen happen in the market. So this chart is actually showing some of the, the growth rates. And like I say, you just normally don't see growth rates at this level. I want to point to the axis is not just a 1% or 10% difference. It's going from 0 to 160%. So in 2002, the cluster market grew by 70%. In 2003, 160%. And it's still growing in the order of 75% a year of market growth. And again, just tremendous changes that, that impacts the marketplace. And if you have any questions, would like to get some more information, check, you can send me an email or check out our website. So thank you very much. Thanks, Earl. And again, I'd like to remind the audience that you can type your questions into the Ask a Question box. And now we have the responses to our second question that we asked the audience. What best describes the field or discipline in which you work? 25.5% said engineering, 23.2% biosciences, 2.3% oil and gas, 4.6% finance, 11.6% academic or research, and 325 of you responded other. So what does this tell you? Oh, this is interesting because uh, it's very good to hear that we have a lot of industrial customers out there and the, and the end users uh, listening uh, because that's really where we see the major growth in the industry. In particular, what we see at the low end of the market, industrial or commercial users of HPC is where the massive growth is. And that's a combination of the price advantage of clusters and also the fact that a lot of the application software has really grown over the last five years so it can replace live experimentation. Antonio, I don't know if you... Yeah, no, I'm into that, you know, nearly 50% is engineering and biosciences, and I think that is, is really uh, an exciting area where, where HPC will have a major impact. Um, the finance actually seems rather low because I, I, I have visited banks which have been using grid computing, they say, for five years, and they have, you know, 10,000 processes. So uh, I think that's a slightly misleadingly small number, but it's very encouraging to see that the engineering and biosciences are having a, a, a real use of HPC. Okay. Simon, was there anything you'd like to add? I'm certainly very interested in the way in which biosciences from perhaps uh, an almost standing start not that many years ago is now almost equal in terms of that usage in the audience that we have with engineering that really shows that acceleration and take up of this technology in that field and I think that in biosciences there are really some opportunities to make a difference using high performance computing and data handling. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we hear from Simon, we have a final question for our viewers. How would you describe your use of high performance computing? Workstation, SMP, cluster, supercomputer, grid, or do not use? While we wait for the results, Simon Cox of the University of Southampton is going to share a user perspective. Simon? Hi. So on the next slide um, is my details, and do feel free to get in touch with me. We've heard a lot um, about distributed systems um, and the way in which they've been used, and this to me is the kind of truth on one slide of what we've done in the last 50 years. We've seen not just the commoditization of the network, of the compute, and of the data, but I think much more now we're seeing that same Moore's law, that same commoditization happening in software, and what Tony talked about with the use of web services and the ability to reuse and share data, that's really where one of the growth areas is 
and where the ability for us to exploit and couple together high-performance computing data all together in a single workflow, that's really where the future for us lies. So on the next slide, one of the areas in which we work quite extensively with companies like Rolls-Royce and BA Systems is in numerical optimization. Here the challenge is very much about doing large-scale computing to understand and model various physical systems. And the sorts of high-performance computing facilities that we have in the University at Southampton include not just large Windows-based high-performance computing systems, but also Linux HPC clusters, and the sorts of distributed computing infrastructure which is deployed on the order of two or 3,000 workstations which are distributed around our campus. And all of these facilities interoperate and we can use them in a seamless grid-like way. On the next slide, you'll see some of the challenges associated with design. And this is work in collaboration with a number of colleagues at Southampton, including Professor Andy Keane. When one is considering designing a new device or a new aero engine or a new wing, looking at all of these factors together, their size, their performance, their strength, Increasingly, though, the effect on, of safety and their impact on the environment is very important. And this application of high-performance computing to design both very large-scale structures, such as the ones in the top right figure, those are large-scale satellite structures, right down to very small-scale photonic structures that are, are nanostructure devices. Design spans all of those challenges and spans all of those um, size and length scales. On the next slide, we'll see an example of a particular uh, piece of work that we've been doing with Rolls-Royce, looking at the optimization of engine intakes. On the figure at the top left, you can see the conventional way in which an aero engine is constructed, and on the right, a slightly different design. The difference between these two designs is that the one on the left is highly tuned and highly performant in terms of the actual giving, giving the best performance for that engine. But what the arrow shows is the way in which noise is scattered from this structure. On the right hand side, this slightly different figure, we call it negative scarfing, you can see that the arrow is indicating where noise is scattered point upwards. Here we're having to trade off between the aerodynamic performance of the engine, which would be you know, absolutely the best on the left hand side, against a slightly different performance characteristic in terms of the fluid dynamics, but a very, very much more favorable noise performance. And so these are the sorts of large-scale challenges that we tackle with high-performance computing. Another example on the next slide is at a much, much smaller scale, and that's showing these sorts of nanostructured silicon devices. And here, patterning the silicon that we fabricate on a size commensurate with the wavelength of the light that you propagate through the material means that you can make that light behave in very interesting ways. You can turn it around sharp corners, but you can also use these devices in reflection mode in order to be able to detect small amounts of biomolecules. And on the right-hand side, you begin to see the complexity of workflows where you need to couple together CAD models, you need to discretize and solve your model, you then need to do some optimization in order to improve that device. And it's this interplay between the high performance computing and the data that's important. And as we move on, you'll see some, I'm going to show you some further examples of that. Moving away from engineering on the next slide, we're working with uh, environmental scientists. Here the challenge is to understand the world not just what the weather is tomorrow, but to understand the impact of our activities in the environment when we look at multi-millennial time scales. So trying to understand how the ice sheets and how the ocean, how the atmosphere and how the biochemistry in the sea has evolved over many thousands of years and how the impact of, of what we're doing now in the climate, how that will affect the climate over the next few hundred years. On the next slide, you'll see that there are a whole set of challenges associated with this. But in particular, it's about supporting a collaborative environment in which environmental scientists with different components of this Earth system model 
are able to put their components together. They're able to then run those in a distributed grid environment, so interoperating between um, Linux resources, Windows resources, um, and the sorts of grids that Earl talked about, and then actually log all of the data that they generate in a database so that they can go back and, and reanalyze and understand what they've done. That was an example from environmental science. Now on the next slide, we have an example which is to do with biomolecular simulation. Many of you will be very familiar with the, the wet protein databases, things like the protein data bank and those gene data banks. Those are derived from microarray data or derived from experimental observations. Here in the Biosim Grid project, we're much more concerned about databasing the results from actual simulations. So the sorts of structures and the sorts of simulations that we perform on those protein structures, the way that the proteins interact with the environment that they're in, and the way that maybe drugs interact with those molecules. Those are simulations that we perform, and the calculations and the results from them, putting them into a database, enable us to do um, to further understand and analyze those molecules and also to build up a, 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 an embedded set of knowledge which tells us in the future how perhaps different proteins might interact or how different drugs might interact with different systems. But building up, if you like, an analogy to those wet protein data banks, building up the exact same but for molecular dynamic simulations that have been performed on computers. Go to the next slide. I've talked quite a bit about just raw high-performance computing and engineering design, a little bit about the way in which computers help us to build databases in environmental science or in biomolecular simulations. But now I'm kind of going to turn that on its head and say that in our wind tunnel experiments, where we're working with um, Formula One teams and America's yacht racing teams, um, this is with a colleague, Kenji Takeda, at the university here in Southampton, now the challenge is, if you go to the next slide, the challenge now is that the data that we're generating is actually coming from large-scale experiments that we're performing. So particle image velocimetry and the sort of way in which we analyze flow in a wind tunnel, but also increasingly noise in the way in which microphone array data is streamed out onto a database and then the challenge is actually the post-processing of that data to understand the experiments that we've done. And on the next slide, this is a very simple example of what I believe to be one of the challenges going out into the future. It's coupling together workflows which involve experiments, which involve large-scale data transfer, which involve databases, and which then involve computing of a whole different variety of sorts. So on the next slide, where are we going beyond that? Well, we can take it as red, this, this increase in performance that we've seen, but that performance, of course, will be given to us in a variety of different ways. And we see, if you like, the reusability of software and the ability to glue things together using web services. But where people have talked about services, they see in other industries those services becoming experiences, those becoming the general way in which people progress their field. And from services to experiences will involve, I believe, a lot of challenges, not just platform strategies and development tools, but also the robustness, security, and reliability of systems, the collaboration technologies that we need for scientists to work together, and also very mundane but very important things such as quality of service. Will my database, will my network, will my computer be available today, now, for the experiment that I'm about to do? So, in summary, as an application scientist, this is a truly exciting time. I think we have an unprecedented ability now and going out into the future to model, to understand, and to shape the world in which we live through using high-performance computing and data resources. Thank you.